So who we are? Always a good question. My name is Diane Garrett-Schmidt, and I am a speech-language pathologist that actually works as an augmentative communication specialist for Intermediate District 287. And another part of my responsibilities this year is working as an innovation coach. And I'm Jason Backus. I'm an occupational therapist by trade, an autism specialist, and I am also an innovation coach with uh, Intermediate District 287. So now we want to find out a little bit about who you are. So at this point, we would like you to choose your role, and are you an educator, a parent or caregiver, administrator, a speech pathologist, an OT, or somebody else? We're going to give everyone a, a few seconds to click on who you are. We always paint a bet on this one, so if there's an extra speech language person hanging out, go ahead and click. Let's see those OTs here. Nice seeing all those educators joining us today, too. Awesome. We're going to give you about... Three, two, one. All right. All right. So we're going to go to the results here. And so now you know who else is here. We've got more educators than anyone else, which is awesome. And because you're the ones who are really, really trying to bug this time around. So yeah. Teachers are great. That's awesome. And we're going to do one more poll. And how long have you had your iPad? Have you had it over a year? Oops. We boxed back. Have you had it over a year, six months to a year, less than six months, or you really don't have an iPad yet, but you just want to have one and you want to know what to do with it before you have it? So we're going to give a few more people to take the poll. We're almost up to all of the people taking the poll, and we're going to skip to the results in three, two, one. So this is... All right, you guys are split. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bunch of people that don't have an iPad yet, so... You know, hopefully you can convince your school district to get you an iPad, um, or if Santa or someone else is really nice to you this holiday season, you might be able to get one um, over the holiday season. So, all right, we're going to go on from here. And why do you really want an iPad? Well, there's multiple modes of presenting information. You have your visual, your auditory, and multimedia, which really taps into a lot of what our students um, use to, to be able to communicate and to, to use four different methods while they're um, learning, and it, it's just a wonderful tool. It requires minimal adult cueing. You know, ultimately, aren't we trying to teach our students to be more independent? And things like the iPad and iPod really help them to be less cue dependent from adults. Um, it includes user in the development process. So when you have your student, they they help you to know what what they like, what they don't like, and how to use it. Um, you can personalize strategies uh, based on interest, based on ability. There, there's so many different ways that you can personalize the iPad. You can incorporate special interests, um, whether it's trains or um, dinosaurs or whatever the student might have an interest in. You can uh, really incorporate those special interests. And then um, it includes safety features to address challenges. Um, there's lots of restrictions. There's ability to track the iPad in case it got stolen. Um, and when you look at the, the cost of the iPad, Compared to communication devices in the past, um, you're talking about $700 to set up a, a very effective communication device as opposed to $7,000 that it cost just several years ago. You know, and the other thing that we'll address a little bit since it's come out is that the iPad Mini. 
And I think that's going to give us a lot of options as well. So, again, even more cost-effective. I personally, I've had bets of people on this one. They should not have made it as expensive as they did <laughs> because it's competing with things that are a bit cheaper. But, again, I think it's an excellent tool for minimal cost. Well, and one of the things that Apple's banking on is that people are already using their product and that, um, you know, the app developers haven't really gone to the other markets as as much as they are in Apple right now. So stay tuned. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the candidates for the iPads. And really, we have used the iPad with individuals that have the diagnoses of autism, developmental cognitive delay, early childhood special ed, severely multiply impaired, specific learning disabilities, what you're going to see on this list, which you actually can read for yourself, is really, we've used it with all of our students. I think we've tried it with every group. You know, it works well for traumatic brain injury, um, kids and adults. It works great with the physically impaired. That one has been a little bit slower in coming because access of the device, which we'll talk about, is changing kind of on a daily basis, um, methods for access. You know, deaf, hard of hearing community is using the iPad a lot. Um, as are the visually impaired and the emotional behavior disordered populations. Student needs that can be addressed through using the iPad. Really, uh, because I get to be the speech language person, my favorite and first on the list, as Jason is smiling, is the augmentative communication. Um, those of you that have been using augmentative communication devices for years know that they can range in price from about you know, $2,500 to, you know, gosh, $10,000. And so the tough part has always been to get functional use of these devices in settings that really can't afford them or if the families can't afford them, if there's no public monies that can assist in purchasing those devices. So what we found is this is finally a tool that we can have in a classroom that allows kids to communicate um, that maybe haven't had that opportunity before. Um, and, you know, really the emotional regulation and behavior management, I really deal a lot with that with the students that I work with. There are so many different ways that we can work with our students to help them with those pieces, whether it's tapping into their interests or using music or different pieces just to help them to regulate themselves and their sensory needs. It, it's really a wonderful thing for them. But I have to tell you, on the emotional regulation and behavior management, as Jason's telling you about the iPad use for that, he's awfully, he has very bruised arms right now. <laughs> so let me have my iPad with me. <laughs> Actually, we were using the iPad for, for the student at this point, and he was communicating with us what he wanted to do uh, as he was scratching me. And obviously, <laughs> Jason didn't move fast enough. So again, it's just a tool. It's not going to solve all of your problems. Exactly. And then fine motor skills, being the uh, having the OT background, um, there there are many different ways that you can use the iPad, um, including writing, uh, voice to text. We'll we'll get a little bit more into that. Um, Pre-writing skills, just being able to work on some finger um, finger manipulation and some finger isolation. There's so many different ways that it supports fine motor skills. Are you going to... You know, that part of the tools for transitioning is really looking at that, um, again, first this, then that. There's a, there's an app for that. There's lots <laughs> of first then type apps. And, and so yeah. what's fun is to have a tool that is able to address this many needs. And I think that's been part of its success in the school and the special ed environment is that it's not just an OGCOM tool. It can cover many different areas. And it may cover a different area for you know each kid in the classroom. And, and as we go on, we'll we'll talk a little bit more, but there there are more ways to help the students, too, um, as the iPad gets older, they're figuring out things like uh, the guided access, which is something that we've had um, issues with with some of our students because of their ability to um, click out of things so quickly. So there, there's a feature we're going to be talking about called guided access uh, later on. So now... It's great for our students, but it's also an amazing tool as a staff. I, 
Yesterday, I actually forgot my iPad at home, and I I was walking around aimlessly. I was lost. <laughs> um, the way that I use my iPad um, is for productivity. I use it when I'm taking notes in meetings. I use it for data collection. Um, I If I have to text a parent, I, I don't use my personal um, text uh, number anymore. I will use an app to text uh, caregivers so that I don't have to um, have my personal number out there so they can't call me at all numbers of all times of the day and night. Um, for using textbooks, and more and more textbooks are out there um, on the iPad. Leisure and recreation, that's a big thing that our students use it for, whether it's um, as a reward or as something that they do outside of school. Um, teaching social skills. There's so many great social skills type apps out there. Um, and it, I know that we'll probably get the question, well, are you going to tell us all about these apps? We did a, another uh, presentation um, on the iPad um, app called App Overload. If you want to know a bunch of different apps, you can go watch that um, webinar and you'll, you'll get a sense of all the wonderful different apps that are out there. Um, I like to also demonstrate lessons and help to decrease anxiety with students uh, using certain apps. And again, check out that other webinar to find out more about those. And one of the things that I think every school dis district is worried about is the safety of their students. And so really, um, looking at the accessibility settings will give you ways to not only access the iPad, but it will also give you ways to block people out of things. So that is really an important area. So let's talk about accessibility settings. The first one you'll notice is VoiceOver. And what VoiceOver is, is it's actually a screen reader that can work through the iPad speakers or through headphones. If you tap the button once, again, once you pull it up under settings, um, you can go ahead and play with it is what I would advise. It doesn't read everything for you. If you put, there are certain web pages that appear to be blocked, so it doesn't read everything. But again, it gives you many options to read what's actually on your iPad screen. The Zoom feature, um, when activated, will enlarge the display on the iPad um, when the screen is tapped with three fingers. And to zoom, um, double tap with the f three fingers. To move around the screen, drag your three fingers. And then to get out, again, three fingers. So the three fingers, and sometimes I'll do this with my iPhone. If I grab my iPhone and I happen to tap it with my three fingers, it'll automatically get bigger. And I just need to remember I need to tap it again with three fingers to um, bring it back down. And if you don't know exactly how to get into accessibilities, it's the little um, gears icon. Once you hit that, and now we're inside the general accessibility settings, okay? Oh, and high contrast. Ta-da, there it is. <laughs> the display just shows it in high contrast. So white on black instead of the opposite. So especially for, for those individuals that have um, difficulty with uh, low vision, this is a great feature for them. Now, with your text size, the default text size um, for menus, um, notifications, and buttons, you can change that. If you are someone who really doesn't, if you forgot your readers for the day, <laughs> and, <laughs> if you need those bifocals, or if you need those bifocals, you can actually set your iPad for the day, um, go into the accessibility features, and change your uh, text size so that you don't have to. Um, you read those small things, and it, it'll um, change it in in your uh, email and everything that you're using on your iPad. And as far as Braille, the iPad is compatible with some Braille display devices. That would be like another whole workshop. So that's all we'll give you for now on that one. And um, the volume can be increased and decreased, and the stereo out um, can be switched so that it's either the right or left if... Um, you have someone who might be hearing impaired and they can't hear out of one ear or the other, um, it might be better to change the, the volume um, mono audio setting. 
And the one called Assistive Touch is interesting. Go ahead and play with it. I haven't really found any great applications for that one yet. But what it does is it, it reads, it interprets your finger gestures. So if you're somebody that uh, uses more of a gross hand gesture, it will start interpreting those gestures as input. Um, it kind of changes the rate and the sensitivity of the iPad. I kind of had mixed results with that one. It's a good in theory. Yeah, kind of it's thing, a good but idea. Even the the individuals that have um, different ways of inputting, what happens is they don't always do it the same way twice. So you're going to have some mixed messages there. iOS six. Let's talk about the on um, iOS six. Um, the new, how, what's it called? Oh, oh the uh, guided line, access. Guided access, that's it. That's your new option under accessibility. So, yeah, under guided access, if you want, there's there's actually some really good YouTube videos on how to do the guided access. I'd really recommend you going out and watching one of the videos. Um, they're anywhere from three minutes to, I think, 15 minutes. It's really worth watching, especially if you have students who have trouble with tapping in on the things like um, they want to be in YouTube all the time. You can change your Safari settings so that they can't access the URL bar. You can change something like if the, you want them to be staying in a communication app or a certain app, you can lock that app so that they can't be getting out of that um, if you want them to be spending a certain amount of time there. Because uh, that, I think, has been our biggest challenge with the students that we work with, is to keep them in, and this is through the speech language people, seriously, you're trying to work on some communication kinds of things, and of course they all know immediately how to get out of the app and into YouTube or something they want to do. And so I think this was something that we had been complaining about to Apple since the beginning of time, and couldn't you lock us in there? And now you are able to do that. So, and one of the other things, too, to think about and consider, which we've started to do with some of our ASD students, is in our classrooms, we have a dedicated communication device, because some students see the iPad as only being a recreational tool, because that's how it was introduced to them. So, we're needing to reintroduce an iPad, maybe with a different color case, as this is a way to communicate. So you have your one that you can communicate with, and then you have your other one where you can do all of your favorite things, and you can use it that way. Yeah, and just know that this is going to be an ongoing issue. It really is, because for most of my classrooms, they can't afford two iPads. Um, although that does solve the problem, it's, it's not always an option. So I do think that that's an issue that we always look at, and we do have discussions with parents on purpose of the iPad, what are we intending to use it for? If our goal is to use it as an augmentative communication tool, shouldn't we establish that first before introducing it as a leisure, you know, a leisure option for some kids? Um, we do have some kids that go home and, and are able to use the iPad independently. That means they can do what they want whenever they want to. And then when they come to school, we do, of course, run into issues that, you know, the teachers are saying, you know, first this, then that. And, and we have more kind of concrete rules around using it, I suppose. So just know that that's something you'll need to address with families as well to talk about the purpose. And we won't be answering questions all along, but I did, did notice that uh, there's a question about guided access being for iPad 2 and higher. And, and the answer is yes, but it's with 6.0 and higher also. You have to have the correct operating system in order to be able to use that. So. Yeah, so you're going to have to update it. All right, the new probably, uh, the exciting thing for me as an augmentative communication uh, therapist is to really look at the options that we now have available for alternative access of the iPad. A lot of the kids I work with do not have the physical ability to actually access the screen. And so what we're looking for is ways to scan through vocabulary to access the screen. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there are right now, um, I believe up there I've got three of them. There's the AbleNet Blue 2 Bluetooth switch. There are the, there's the RJ Cooper switch, um, Bluetooth switch. And there's also one that's not on there that is out by Inclusive TLC is the name of it. And it's called the Applicator. And that one gives you four switch access. Now, the one thing to be aware of is that 
Although that allows you to access the iPad, it only allows you to access apps that are written to take that input. So they do not allow you to access everything on the iPad. Okay, does that make sense? So again, it, it won't allow you to access everything, but it does allow you to access some communication apps. That's that's Jason's subtle way of telling me to move on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, right. Oh, bro. Uh, so the the other thing that you'll want to know about is restrictions because some of the kids you may not want them having access to things like the internet or YouTube. Which if you update your iPad to six point oh or higher, YouTube is no longer an app on app, on the iPad um, because. Apple and Google are two people who don't play well together. So um, since YouTube is now owned by Google, they decided that they're not going to have their app an automatic feature on the iPad. But you can download it if you want. But it does help if you have kids that get obsessed with YouTube not having it on there. Um, you can also limit iTunes, um, purchasing, installing apps, deleting apps, and, and this is really good if you have kids that are button pushers and they really like to just play around. If you lock them out of these things, it really helps so that you don't have to worry about, oh, that app's disappeared again, or, oh, they just spent $500 on my uh, credit card. So we don't want that happen happening. So if you have some kids that are button pushers, you might want to check out the restrictions feature in um, the general settings. And seriously, I have kids that can purchase things before you turn around. So before you even think of giving an iPad to a student, make sure you've gone through and stopped them from installing or deleting apps or adding apps. It's ridiculous. I swear I turned around for two seconds and I had spent 25 bucks. So just be aware. Okay, the next area we'll address is kind of the access and positioning. Um, because the iPad is now Really, it, it can be, you have to know, I'm not an Apple person, so Jason just laughed. It took me a while to actually accept the fact that I was going to be using an iPad. And um, now I'm pretty much addicted to it and have found that there are so many things that you can do with it, even for kids that have significant physical disabilities. You know, the considerations you're going to look at include age and their skill level. You're going, you really have to look at classroom safety issues. Um, I think Jason's program has more students than mine does as far as kids that may throw it. Um, so again, there's safety issues with an iPad that you may not have thought about. Before. And one of the things as we, we talk about um, the, the options for cases, well, we'll talk about the bon bounceability factor and um, we've, we've had to really figure out which ones bounce the best. Yep. You're looking at the number of students using the device. Um, is it going to be geared particularly to one student or, do, you know, do 10 different kids have to use it for 10 different things? And the number of environments, how much time is it going to be traveling? Is it going from classroom to classroom? Is it going to stay in the same classroom all day? Um, things to consider, you know, really when you're looking at it, sometimes kids do better with it going straight up and down instead of laying flat. If you have kids that are, used, are kind of switch uh, pressers and they just keep doing it over and over and over again, you could break that habit by making it stand straight up and down. Um, you're looking at whether you need a permanent solution or a temporary mounting solution, and that will help determine what you need as well. Key guards are available. Now, be aware that key guards, although available and wonderful, um, it locks you pretty much into that app. In order to access anything else, if I'm using a key guard for a 32 where um, app, when I go back to the menu and I want to play Angry Birds or something else, just know that key guard is going to be coming off and on all day. There are also straps um, to hold it, to allow you to hold it, um, and you're going to check those, again, those accessibility settings and the restrictions. So how to keep the iPad safe? Making a decision on cases. Well. Um, Sometimes you need to pay a little bit more. I, I'll just be honest with you. Um, we actually just added 35 more iPads to our school, and 
I wanted to try to see if I could get something cheaper and see. It looks just like another case, and when we got them, they just were not that great. Um, so, um, again, you, you want to consider how many environments you're going to be using in, um, the needs transport, button access, screen protection, and then, again, that um, bounceability, throw drop factor, um, whether the, the kid needs straps or not, um, the weight and the size of the case, if um, the, the student needs to um, have something more lightweight, um, there, there's all those features that you need to consider. So we're going to show you a few options. And here's a few options that we've used. This is not in any way, shape, or form a recommendation that you have to get these. But these are the ones that we've used. You know, we've had mixed results with some, and some we just love. Um, you'll notice on the top left, for anybody who's using it as a communication option, my big thing is it better be with them at all times or it's really not a communication option. <laughs> so the Sherpa carrying case was actually designed for kind of business people taking it around. So um, that one is actually nice. I think it's, I don't know if it's real leather or fake leather. You can get a, probably a year to two years out of that particular case. It seems like ours has lasted that long. But it does allow you to carry it across the, here I'm demonstrating, you just can't tell. <laughs> you get to wear it across your body, so kind of over the head across the body, so that if it is somebody that could throw it or drop it, um, if they let go of it, it's fine because it's still hanging from their body. So anything with a strap going across the body has been great. You know, big grips, if you're looking for kind of younger kids, big grips and the grip cases, um, my favorite because of the color. And they're made out of, okay, what would you call it? Foam? Uh, kind of like a foam. Um, and, and the grip cases, actually, we've got quite a few grip cases here in this building, which is... Um, a building where we have only special education students um, who are either EBD or ASD or have some significant um, disabilities. Um, and we use an awful lot of the grip cases. We did start out with the outer box, and we like the outer box. The, um, when the outer box came out with the iPad 2 case, um, there was a poor design there. They've, they've increased their design um, and, and they've gotten much better again, um, closer to when they had the OtterBox for the iPad 1. So, um, and the, the new case that they have is good on the um, iPad 2 or the iPad 3. So, um, I, sometimes for the extra money, the OtterBox is a good option. Gumdrop is similar to the OtterBox. And then um, another one that we, we've just invested in is um, the Griffin Survivor Series. Um, and so those, those are the ones that you're going to have the best luck if you're, you're going to need something that you can have dropped or thrown. Durability is great. So again, on the, the other thing you want to look at is if you have a kid that's going to be carrying it around, what I like about the grip case is if you look at it, you essentially have a handle on all four sides. The big grip, um, it doesn't. And I know that the guy said that they were going to add a handle to it because a lot of us were complaining if you're running from place to place to really have something that you do have a good grip on it is important. There's also the body mounts that allow you, it's, on, it's pretty much just an elastic you know, band that holds like an iPod or an iPad on your leg or on your lap. Another so the other part with the grip case, too, is you can be holding on to one side of it while a student's holding on to it so that it doesn't get thrown. Um, and, <laughs> it's like a tug of war. <laughs> and, and the other thing that some students like if they're using it for a leisure um, app is it's it's got two handles if they're using it as like a driving car or something, so it's like a steering wheel for them. Okay, and somebody just said to it is the same material that they use for Crocs, the shoes, it's that kind of stuff. Now, the other thing, what we were wondering about is we had a couple students that we knew were going to try to chew on them, and we had one that actually chewed into an iPad, unfortunately. But um, the cool part was was that the sad truth is, is we actually spent some time having somebody at one of our meetings, one of our staff people decided to try to bite a chunk of it off. Yeah, I tried. I couldn't and, get it and, that Yeah, way. and and we couldn't break it off. So that was our greatest fear on the grip case is because that handle around the edge is not that thick. Could somebody bite through it? And 
you know, not yet. It's been really hard. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll keep working on it. I'll keep chewing on it and let us know. Then we were looking at what's the way to put it someplace and keep it safe, um, for, and also to put it so that it's accessible to kids in wheelchairs. So there's a variety of things that are now available, and seriously, there's probably hundreds now. Um, but the ones that I think we've used kind of fall into these categories. There's a variety of wall mounts that are available. So if you're worried about that really throwing is a huge huge issue, you can permanently, well, permanently or even semi-permanently attach it to a wall. Well, and a low-tech way that you could use it is you could use like a um, plate holder and uh, mount the plate holder to the wall and then just put the um, iPad in the plate holder. Yeah, true, but I know I'd knock that off in a second. So <laughs> I would go with the wall mount. <laughs> but pretty much lock that sucker in there. <laughs> Then you're going to look at things that there's, um, in the center, there's a friction knob mount. So that, again, if you see the knob in the center, you tighten that, and you can you can actually change the height or the, move it to the left, to the right. And that one is, is held together by a friction mount. There's clamp mounts that allow you to mount it to either a wheelchair, um, what do you call it, the pipe on a wheelchair, or you can mount it to the table. So I do have several students that will move it depending on what their task is. So it might be attached to their wheelchair for much of their day, but if they're actually going to be doing an educational activity that they're going to be using it for, we'll then move it to the table and clamp it on there. Suction mounts can be great, but here's what you have to watch for. If there's any moisture, any saliva, any dirt, um, you just have to be aware that it, it may not hold. So you're really going to have to clean the surface and clean the suction cup before you stick it in there because it could go flying yet. And then there's the drill-in mounts, which you're, again, Jason's telling me to be quiet, but um, the drill-in ones, that means that you're going to have to talk to your custodian and make sure it's okay to drill a hole in something to attach that one permanently. Wheelchair mounting options, again, they look very much the same. There's one, there are mounting systems that will allow you to use it in a reclined position. Again, it's much better in person because she's using a lot of hand gestures. <laughs> <laughs> really, we should be doing this on video. So anyway, as I'm sitting back with my hands in the air, what I'm trying to show you is that really you can mount them on virtually any plane. Um, the ones that I think we've used the most have been the daisy mounts and the mountain mover mounts. Okay, some other wheelchair mounting options. You know, there's the magic arm from R.J. Cooper. That one's held up pretty well. Um, the, the, the modular hose one is interesting, and we thought it would be – what it seems to be good for is for assessment purposes because you can actually move it around and find a good spot to keep the iPad for access purposes. But once you've got that established, to be honest with you, I think I would move to a more permanent or a more stable mount. Uh, but it is good for assessment. And then there's the stealth iPad mount as well. And just some helpful hints that we found in working with the iPad. Um, you know, it's really great to make folders. Hopefully you've all learned how to make folders by now. If you haven't, you press and hold one of the buttons until it starts to shake. So we press an app until it starts to shake. Um, it'll start to shake and there'll be a little black X in the corner and then you drag the icon over another icon, and what happens is it creates a folder, and you can actually name that folder. Apple will give you an idea of, well, this is a possible name for it, or you can put in your own name. Um, so Apple might say education, uh, education app, um, as opposed to, you know, you might want it as literacy. Uh, so, again, you can make folders, and it's really good. Students. You can divide those according to students. I think some of yep. the teachers, I see that they have them according to topic, like reading, math, um, drawing, whatever it may be, and then some of them have the folders named by students. Yeah, like Johnny's uh, favorites and yeah. um, Jill's favorites, and so so they'll have different students. So the student can just tap into that, and then they can go to all the ones that they like. Uh, and then you can have your shared and, or common ones in a separate folder. Okay, okay, and this story has absolutely nothing to do with what he's going to talk about next. But I just have to tell you, there's a little girl that I just met um, the other day, and this is a little girl that is a, you know, has been diagnosed with autism. 
And the cool thing was, this is a little girl who throughout her day, I actually watched her for a morning, hardly used her hands at all for anything, didn't explore objects, didn't pick anything up. She really was just finger flicking all day, doing herself spin thing. And then the teacher took out the iPad. This little girl, they had hidden a bunch of the apps into folders, and you, you guys know how tiny those are. This little girl was able to um, slide the screens back and forth, find what she wanted in a folder, and open it up. And again, this was a student who really, based on observations that the staff had had up until then, what they were going to write on her report was this, this child really didn't have functional use of her hands. And then she saw the iPad. And then we found out from mom that sure enough, they had an iPad at home that they had been using and she likes to watch YouTube videos. But we just laughed because we tried sliding the screens around, moving things in folders, and she would actually isolate her finger to get to what she wanted to get to. How cool is that? So that that's awesome because, you know, we have so many students who are like that, that once you introduce them to the iPad, um, the world opens up. And, and this could set us off on a whole discussion on it. Yeah. So, so we'll keep going. <laughs> but, but again, think about it as a tool. I mean, really, it's a tool that allows kids to do things they've never been able to have access to before. So if you want to multitask, um, if you double tap your home button, what happens is the screen, uh, the, if you look at the picture, the screen pulls up and it shows you the, the latest app that you were in. So you can um, see that you were in this app, and then you can just tap it. So if you know that you were just in something and you don't want to have to go searching through all your folders, you can just use this multitasking to do it that way. The other way that you can do it is if you have the iOS 5 or higher on your iPad, you can use a four-finger sweep up. So you take your four fingers and push up on the screen, and it will open it up the same way. If you use your four fingers to, once it's open, uh, actually, this one is, if once it's open, you can sweep to the right, and you have your screen resolution, your brightness, your volume, all there. And then if you use four fingers, you can sweep between apps that you have recently opened. So if you want to go from Notes to Maps to Dropbox, you can use your four fingers, and it will go from screen to screen to screen. Now, the one thing that was that took me a while to learn is that once I opened it, it didn't close, even if I moved on to something else. So, Jason, you want to talk about that? So if you, if you are in the habit of just when you're done with an app, go on to the next app, which most people are, um, what happens is all these apps are available still on the bottom in your queue, and they're eating up battery life. So if you wanted to take and extend your battery life, what you want to do is just like when you're opening up a folder, you um, tap on an app once it's open on the bottom, and then it'll start shaking, and that X will come up, and then you just tap those X's to get rid of all those apps that are open. And what that does is that prolongs your, your battery life. Um, your app isn't gone off your iPad. It just takes it out of the, the queue. And make sure, you, if you're like me, you really don't pay attention to that. And so then I was whining about my battery. <laughs> and what I found out was when I opened that up, I had absolutely everything open. Everything she ever and there's used was no open. Way, and there's no way to close more than one at a time. Yeah. At this point in time, I keep thinking that will be there. Yeah, next. I'm hoping iOS 6.2 might have that. But yeah, right now so you doesn't. really seriously have to X every one of those hundreds of apps that you may have open. Yep. <laughs> um, just helpful, and with Pinch, you can, you know, make things smaller. You can, um, with if you start with a pinch and then pull it up, you can expand things like your photos. Um, there, there's lots of different ways that are intuitive for young kids, not always intuitive for, for older users who are just starting out with it. All right, and here we can talk a little bit of some of our successes and some of the challenges that we've had. 
And really, I think the biggest thing in my mind has been the increased availability of augmented communication systems for kids. And because, again, I mean, our district, we do assessments. That's what we do is um, assessments. And so we've had a pool of devices that we're able to loan out to our member districts. But what's cool is that with the iPads, we can have enough of those to make sure the kids have a good trial before we decide that, yep, this is what they really need to have. Um, if there's been a huge increase in personally owned communication systems, and we'll talk about the challenges to that as well. We found after the iPads came out, I can't even begin to tell you, I think in one district we had 15 kids show up after Christmas <laughs> with iPads, and, we're, and, they, and the parents like, okay, we want them to use these, and it's like, oh my gosh, now what are we going to do? So again, um, pros well, and cons to everything. And not only that, they show up with the most expensive uh, yeah. communication app and it's really something that they they don't need or, or isn't even at the level that they could use it right now. So the parents spent $200 on this communication app that really we could have probably gotten away with, you know, a free one to start out with or, you know, something as you know, cheap as, Twenty or forty dollars. Yep, and that's why I really look at the, um, yeah, again look at the other um, in service that we did on app overload because really I think what's cool is initially there really was only one communication app and that first came out and that was Prolo Prolo Quote to Go. Now that is excellent and it. It's a wonderful, wonderful app, but it is not for everybody. And so, again, if you look at the other uh, webinar, you'll see many, many options that you can actually match to a student's abilities, and that makes a huge difference. So, um, we, when, when we're doing social stories with students, um, there's lots of apps out there now for social stories. And, again, if you, you check into the other webinar, um, it, that will address some of those. Um, but if you want to create your own social stories, the way that we like to do it is using iMovie. Um, iMovie has the best editing features, um, depending on the abilities of your student and what type of video modeling you're using. Um, if you're using video modeling where you're doing some practice first and then you're just doing a video, then you don't have to do much editing. Um, then that's great, but for the ones that you do need to edit or, or you're doing video self-modeling, which um, both of those are great evidence-based practices with uh, ASD students. Um, you you need that editing feature, and iMovie is the best one out there for that. Uh, so for your, uh, I believe, $9.99, you really get your money's worth in um, editing feature. And I don't get paid anything from Apple in selling that, um, but it is really the best tool out there for that. Um, again, increasing social interactions. Not only can you increase social interactions by showing them what to do and uh, teaching them that with social stories, um, just the fact that they have an iPad and it's a cool thing that every kid wants, not just kids with disabilities, every kid wants to have it or be around a kid that has it. Um, we've had instances where we'll teach kids how to play a game so that they can play a game with a typical peer. Um, and that's a really fun thing to do. And really think about the social interaction. The cool, it's almost like having a bunch of game boards with you. So Connect Four is on there. Um, trying to think Checkers, of, Chess, Checkers, uh, Chess. Pac -Man. There, there's a, a Pac-Man game where four people can play at the same time. Yeah. Um, bowling. There's a really cool action bowling was my first one on there. And what it did was I can't tell you the number of kids that learned through action bowling, a free app, <laughs> how to slide their fingers on the screen. Because, again, what they needed to learn was that particular motion. So, And the whole turn-taking thing, that, yep, you get to turn, now it's my turn. And it's so visually presented on there. Um, so I do know the speech clinicians that have them, that are using them, again, for the turn-taking piece of it, um, it's wonderful because, again, your turn, my turn, and it's in a very limited area. And there's also a really good visual app for um, turn-taking, too, um, which, again, is is one that you'll see in the other presentation. Um, but basically, it, visually, it shows how much time you have to take your turn um, and then how much time the next person has. So, And you can set it up however you want uh, as far as the amount of time you want for each turn to last. So then you also have kids knowing that 
they need to take their time within a certain amount of time um, because some kids have trouble with that initiation and with the ending of their terms. My husband needs that for Scrabble. <laughs> okay, and the reinforcement of ac- the academic concepts. Now, what's really cool about that, I can't tell you the number of kids that don't particularly enjoy being in some of the academic groups, but almost, you know, I, I don't even know how many apps there are, but realistically... There's um, over 750,000 apps. <laughs> see, and that's why we can usually find an app that reinforces what the kids are learning. And then, really, we have a lot of families that do have them at home. And so we could say, you know, here's a free app that kind of matches what we're working on. And I can't even begin to tell you the number of kids that learn skills faster because they're willing to practice at home because it's more fun. Yeah, it's 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 wonderful how they, they can do that. All right. We're just about out of time. Uh, some of the challenges that we've... Uh, come across. Um, oh, here's a big one. This one I get. <laughs> it continues to require what I think the theory initially was, oh, gosh, give them iPads and they can talk. Well, wouldn't that be cool? It is not a reality. Um, the reality is is that an iPad requires as much time um, from therapists, from paras, from everybody to in order to support it, in order to program and customize it. Um, in order to look at the student's day and figure out where it can be implemented successfully. None of those issues, uh, it's exactly the same issues that you deal with with virtually any augmentative communication device. So I think the thought was that if we have iPads in the classroom, it'll take less speech clinician time or less therapy time. It, that has not held up at all. It has actually increased um, the amount of time needed to, to make sure it's going to work. Um, the good news is, is if they um, have one, they've taken a step in the right direction. Your complication is going to be that if they have two, um, which does happen, that some schools do not want the kids' personally owned iPad in school, is that you, it takes a significant amount of time to transfer the programming and back up from one iPad to put it on another iPad. Um, I know Proloquo has had some issues lately with the backing up because it used to be that we could do it wirelessly and with their newest version, um, that's not working. So again, what you will see on these apps is there are pre-made, just like with the devices, they come with a pre-programmed set of vocabulary. Um, but to let you know, after doing this for many, many years, um, there are very few students who actually fit within the parameters established. I can't tell you the number of kids that learned to hate OGCOM because they were given, um, you know, a really extensive vocabulary that confused them and they couldn't find the stuff they wanted to say the most. So anyway, just a thought on that one. Um, so sometimes the iPad's difficult um, to share with others, um, especially when you're looking at communication devices um, to, to make sure that everyone's updated. And, and there's better features now that the iPad's been around for several years. It used to be that you had it connected to your computer in order to um, make sure that everyone had the same updates and everything, but you no longer need to do that with the iCloud. So um, that's a really good good thing that we don't have to do that to maintain it anymore. But here's the drawback. If the whole family is iClouding it on the same account, <laughs> the sister's pictures are going to show up in brother's iPad. Um, so that has been something that you just have to be aware of. We've had families' emails show up on a kid's iPad, you know, that they brought to school and just told, just had to kind of remind them that, you know, your emails are showing up here. Um, so those are just things to be aware of. Um, and some students while it's great and gets them engaged, some students will still use the iPad to just demo off of. Um, they may use their um, tool and they will rub it on the screen and they will stim on it or they will flap and they will tap. And um, But ideally, we want to get them engaged in it. Yeah, so we seriously would not, like the kid that's a tapper, likes to tap and make lights flash, there are some apps I do not want on there for him <laughs> because that's what he would spend his day doing. So again, making sure that you're limiting access to those apps that the kids really do like to stim on. I do not use any apps that have, you know, the feature where you tip your iPad one direction or another. I'm sure there's like a technical name for that. <laughs> 
or if you shake it, it'll do something. If you tip it back and forth and sideways, here's the deal. For the most part, because my purpose really is um, communication and, and making progress in that area, I don't want them shaking it. I don't want them turning it upside down. Um, I don't want them to think of it as a toy. So, again, that's something that I'll watch for. And, again, it's something that will require training. Um, for some people, they they get it and they understand it because it's similar to their iPhone. But there's a lot of people who don't know how to use a smartphone, don't know how to use apps, don't know how to tap and sweep. And so sometimes it's really basic things that you need to uh, train staff and caregivers on. And again, just making sure that you do keep updating. Um, I think that's something that we run into too is you just kind of forget to do it. So making sure that you take, you're looking at the updates that are available to that particular iPad and looking at what that's going to change. Now the interesting thing is in some of the apps, um, we actually have one, a fairly extensive communication app that they've now said is not going to work on um, the original iPad. While a lot of our schools or some of our schools purchase those, the chances of them getting new ones are pretty much non-existent. So again, looking towards the future and, and again, deciding whether you want to take the update or not. You don't have to take an update. See, we're kind of lucky with our district because our district looks at the iPad as the same type of technology as, say, a laptop. And so we're looking at a turnover every two to three years on our iPads. Um, that's not realistic in all school districts, but we have the luxury in our school district that um, that's what's being looked at. That's why Jason's got a nicer iPad than I have. <laughs> all right, so Jason has over a thousand apps, and Jason has the um, 64 uh, gigabyte memory. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so no, obviously I'm working on the wrong program. But again, it has been an excellent tool. It does not solve your problems, but it gives you options that I think we've never had available to us before. I think the technology, including you know the little um, iPad Mini, I think is going to be an excellent option communication-wise for kids that are ambulatory because, again, the iPad itself is a little bit big. Um, for kids that are in work environments, it does bang into stuff a lot. So we have used the iPod Touch for that, and I think the iPad Mini is going to take the place of that. We needed a little bit bigger screen. So I know that Gloria's um, given you guys our email addresses. If you guys were patient, you could have seen that they are at the end of the presentation <laughs> because Gloria put them out several times. Um, and we have a few minutes left uh, right now if, there, if people want to... Um, have questions, we'll, we'll read them um, in the chat section and try and address them as we're going. Um, were there any that you noticed, Gloria, that um, you wanted us to try and answer right away? Uh, here's a question of what we do with our old iPads. Um, our old iPads, we actually sell out to the state, and then the state refurbishes them, and they send, sell them to companies. Excellent. And yes, we do have a good district. We must admit that we are we're, lucky. We're, we're enough very lucky. To, we're lucky enough to have administration that's, that's willing to support some of the changes in technology. And um, again, part of our job this year is really looking at how do we um, get this new technology into the classrooms. And not only how do we get it there, but we have to make sure it's not sitting in closets. This is the first time with technology that I have ever seen it being used to this extent. It does take staff training in order to do it, but I can guarantee you that iPad is not in the closet, um, which is where we'd find a lot of the technology in the past. Um, do we have an app for an ASL dictionary? Yes, oh, there's tons. There's tons out there. There's a bunch that are free, and you know those are going to give you limited um, vocabulary, but the ones that are cost a little bit more um, You'll you'll be able to get more vocabulary. Yeah, go uh, ahead and search. Yeah, and those. go ahead and search for ASL vocabulary. You will find Spanish apps, translating apps. Um, we just used a translating app the other day for a meeting with a family that um, spoke Spanish. Um, so again, there's many many options out there, and some you know again, it's a matter of just taking the time to do a search and seeing what's available because you will be um, amazed. 
at what is an option. There's a question here about um, any programs that will um, uh, consider awarding classrooms with free iPads through grants or such. Yeah, there's lots out there. Um, check your local service groups, your your Kiwanis, your Lions clubs. Um, any well, sometimes there's local business or Rotary clubs that want to um, make a difference, and so really ask, ask, ask. Um, you know, the Minnesota Autism Society does grants um, that you can request. Um, they do grants once a year. Um, there's lots of different ways to um, try and get iPads. Um, just you got to be creative and you got to keep going until someone gives you the yes answer. Um, and some of it is look at how they're being used in your building. If regular ed is using them on a, you know, for math, you know, for whatever classes it may be, if they have access to iPads, special ed needs to have access as well. So I think that's something that's come out as well, is that you can't get to one group and not the other. We've actually gotten older iPads from regular ed when they're upgrading theirs, um, but then they, it seems like that's when they would also give us those, you know, the ones and the twos if they're moving to the threes. So there's a question here about Bluetooth devices um, disconnecting when they're 20 to 40 percent discharged. Have you had any I haven't that? really run into that. No, I can't say I've noticed that at all. Success with printing? I do. Oh, yeah. I I can. Um, basically, you need a Bluetooth printer, and you have to generally download an app for that printer. And um, I print um, at home, and because I have, a, I believe it's an HP printer that I have Bluetooth on my network, and I just. Um, when I uh, want to print something, I open up what I want to print in my printing app, and then I print it. Well, thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate you guys taking the time, and I know it's your lunch time. So um, thanks again. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions that we could help you out with.